Hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's fantastic that everyone's made it, especially right in here to the theatre at Real Air Live. It's great to see you all, despite the train uh, dramas that everyone's had getting here. But it's also fantastic to see so many young faces in the audience. And I know that our next guest is particularly excited about meeting some young fans later on, so we'll make sure that happens. Um, she has had such a phenomenal last couple of seasons. She's just rising and rising in the ranks of professional cycling. Let's get her straight up here, shall we? Put your hands together for Debbie Bollery. Yeah, it was 
difficult to go around uh, the, uh, the Netherlands and do a lot of races. So in the beginning, I didn't do the real races, but more the um, yeah the children races. We call them the Bonde race, so on the fat tire, uh, like the school bikes, uh, that kind of racing I did, and I, I thought it was so cool. Um, and I really wanted to do the real races, but that took a time uh, before I could do that. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy to just be outside and, and being a bit playful on the bike. Um, and I was, I was really competitive, so uh, I, I just really wanted to do the real races. <laughs> and it's amazing that you can combine that fun with being competitive, because not everyone can manage that. No, exactly, no. I mean, you need to be, you need to have a bit of both, I think. Um, you need to have the fun, um, yeah, to be also competitive, I think. Uh, because if you're only really competitive, then in the end it's not fun anymore. Because in, in, in cycling especially, you will lose more than that you can win. So if you don't have the fun in it, then it will be hard, I think. It's a really lovely philosophy and a nice reminder. <laughs> Another brilliant image uh, behind us here on the stage. This is your dog. Yeah, <laughs> this is Flo. <laughs> Tell us about your relationship with Flo, because uh, there's so many images of you. I think I saw one where you're getting aero with Flo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Flo is really an adventure dog also, so she really likes to, to be outside and uh, come with us uh, on the adventures. And uh, most of the times I'm on my bike, and of course it's difficult for her to keep up. So, uh, yeah, this is on the gravel bike also. So. Uh, <laughs> She, she really likes to run next to the bike, uh, so when it's uphill and on a quiet road, I, I let her go and then she, she runs next to the bike and uh, yeah, then at one point she's a bit tired and I put her in a backpack, but she likes it so much because she can see from my back, she can so, see so much, so then I'm riding and she's looking around, see all the birds and yeah, she really loves it. That is absolutely brilliant. And how, how long and how many miles can you get in with, with Flo still being happy in the backpack? Can you do another one? <laughs> yeah, not too much because she is, she is not uh, that small, of course. So she, uh, her weight is 15 kilos. So in the end, you have a pretty sore back also. And it's good training. I mean, it's good core work. But uh, most of the times, I, I uh, switch a bit between my partner, partner and me. And then, uh, yeah, also she is running a bit loose. So I think around 20k uh, an hour that we do uh, together with her. And uh, yeah, then I do some more training. Or most of the times, only on the easy days, she goes with us. I was going to ask you later in this interview what's your key to success, but it's clear that it's this training yeah. with the dog. Right? <laughs> you get really strong from it. <laughs> Everybody's going to be doing this for next season, I yeah. think, after the performances you put in. And am I right in saying that you also do uh, a bit of yoga with Flo involved as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything I do, she wants to do with me. So if I put my yoga mat out uh, in the morning, uh, she's immediately on it. And, put her a bit away because otherwise I don't have space to move anymore but uh, yeah she, she enjoys it uh, to be always with me uh, so yeah I mean yoga is really nice uh, to start the day always with so uh, that's one of the things I always do as well as it being a really nice thing to do yoga off the bike how important is it to look after your body when you do so many grueling miles out in the elements to do that other side of strength and conditioning uh, for me, it's really important, I think, um, especially because I come from speed skating, uh, you do a lot of stretching always. You always warm up before you go on the ice ring, and then after you, you did your training on the ice ring, you, you do cooling down, uh, so you do a little level of running, and you stretch. Um, you're always really busy with this uh, to, to warm up the muscles, and in cycling, you never do that. Um, you always go on the bike, and puff, you're off. Um, so, for out of speed, uh, ice skating, I, I was used to stretch uh, before I, I stepped uh, on the ice ring or something. So I, I took that with me um, uh, when I was uh, completely focused on cycling. So always in the morning, I tried to st stretch a bit. Um, then after I rode my bike, uh, it felt always so good to, to just stretch the legs. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in COVID year, uh, we had a lot more time and I always wanted to try yoga. And actually, it's, it's also 
stretching, but a bit, um, a bit longer, a bit uh, more, um, a bit a new uh, challenge for myself also. So then I started with yoga, and um, just in the mornings uh, can be ten minutes, and then uh, and then I start my day off. And uh, yeah, I kept doing that, and uh, I really like it because yeah, normally if you jump out of bed, uh, you start the day and everything is hurry, 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 and now you step out your bed, you do first some relaxing yoga, and I don't know, it, it makes also that your day starts different. You, you make some time for yourself already in the beginning of the morning, so that, that feels good. That's really nice, and actually, I think yoga can be really hard as well. Yeah, I mean, you have also some power yoga or pilates, that, that's a lot of core work, um, but in the morning I do just easy stretching. Nice. And, and do you think everyone in the peloton recognizes the importance of strength and conditioning work now and doing yoga? Or are there some people that still go, oh, I don't want to stretch, I don't want to do that? I think there are still people who don't want to do that, of course, but I think it's, it's coming more and more. I mean, uh, cycling, uh, especially by the women's you see that, that, that they're complete athletes and they want to be not only good on the bike, but just a good athlete. And that's also for myself. I, I really uh, think it's important to also do the core work, even it's, it's not a nice training, but I think it's important um, because yeah, on the bike in the end it's not only pushing the pedals, it's especially on the planche by Lafie, for example, you really need your core to sit stable on the bike and yeah, you, you use every muscle if you do it right, so um, for me it's important to do it. Talk more about that climb a little bit later because there's so much to dive into with the images we can see behind. Um, but you were talking there about your routine in the morning and doing some yoga. Something else I've noticed is you have the same rocket coffee machine as me. And I have a very important question Can you do coffee art? Coffee art? <laughs> well, if you follow me on Instagram, you can see I cannot do it good, but I'm, I'm, I'm improving a lot. <laughs> I'm still at the point where I, I just have a drop of like coffee milk in the top. I mean, that's like, as far as it's gone. Do you have any tips for me to improve? Yeah, I mean, uh, how you um, shave the milk, I think that's the important part already. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the handling, it's, it's difficult. You, you need to practice it. It's practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Why is coffee such a thing for cyclists? I don't know, maybe because you have so much time? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, caffeine, uh, caffeine you use always in the races, of course, so... Uh, I don't know, I, I really like it. And also, when you go on a bike ride, some nice coffee stop is also really nice always, so... Uh, yeah, it's, it's just... Also, it, it uh, longs in my morning routine. After my yoga, I put on my rocket uh, machine and then... Uh, yeah, I do my breakfast and I make a nice coffee and then, and then I'm ready for the day. I'm sure a lot of people here will be happy to know that you still have a coffee stop on your training rides <laughs> because to be at your level, we don't always imagine you have time to stop. <laughs> yeah, of course, not always. I mean, most of the trainings uh, I don't stop, but uh, especially soon when I start uh, riding my bike again um, after the off-season. Um, then you do always the easy rides, and in easy rides, uh, it's always nice to stop for a coffee. How much time do you get for the off season in reality? Um, now I have uh, yeah, almost three weeks uh, without a bike. I think. Um, I mean, the first week after uh, the first week of my off season was a bit difficult because uh, I felt super shit uh, after uh, <laughs> after uh, the tour of Romandia. So, um, and it was weird because, yeah, my season ended a bit strange because I got COVID at the Worlds and then the Monday I was not that good, I didn't recover and, yeah, I felt not good. So, after the Monday, the Monday I was completely empty, so I also needed some time off the bike. I mean, I was really still, I really wanted to ride the bike, but I was just empty or something, so I couldn't. And then I just did some easy walks with my dog, but it was also very nice. Um, and then after a week, uh, I felt a bit more like uh, settled in my rest or something. You feel also that you come to a rest because the first week it feels a bit awkward, a bit weird to not have your bike, uh, not sitting on the bike the whole time. And yeah, then uh, <coughs> my last two weeks uh, of uh, holiday uh, was very nice. 
And when you have a rest day, you often will, as professional cyclists, have to still ride gently to keep the legs fresh. In the off season, is it completely off the bike? Yeah, now I have two weeks, two weeks uh, without the bike at all. And normally, when I go on holiday, I always rent uh, maybe a mountain bike or something uh, because I just really like it to to explore uh, in a new country or something. So then it's nice to rent a mountain bike and see a bit more. But um, yeah, now we had uh, two weeks in Sicily and uh, yeah, we didn't touch the bike. We did of course some runs because I always also really like uh, running or hiking. So that was what we did now, but um, yeah, two weeks, no bike. No. And do you have to avoid running during the season in case you were injured? Or can no, you do it? Um, I always try to, to keep running a little bit on my schedule. And of course, between races, it's difficult, um, especially for, for example, uh, in the spring classics, it's really difficult to, if you have two or three days in between the races, yeah, you, you don't run. Um, but if I have a longer training period, uh, I always try to put some running in my trainings because running is also a kind of a poor work. Um, so I really like to, to use also my other muscles. Um, yeah, and running also, if you do it a lot, then then your body is used to it. Um, but if you stop running for a long time and you pick it up again, it costs always a lot of energy because you've got so much muscle pain. Um, so I always try to, to keep running a little bit on my schedule. Just casting an eye back to the screen again. I mean, what a beautiful image. When you do have a couple of weeks off, does it give you a chance to reflect and look back at just how much you've achieved in the last two seasons? Yeah, of course. I mean. Uh, sometimes it's good to, to look back, uh, back and especially as an athlete you're so focused uh, on moving forward. Um, it's always from one goal to another goal to another goal and you don't have much time in the season to look back and think how everything went. So um, yeah, in off season of course you think a lot back and also you have some evaluation uh, talks with, uh, with, with, with the team um, and that's really good to, to see uh, what was good but what also can be better. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of time to think about last year and uh, yeah, that was nice. Really happy, yeah. <laughs> really happy with that. And again, I'd like to go back to the beginning uh, for a little bit to understand kind of how you got to where you are today. I mean, the title of this talk is The Next Superstar. I think we can all agree you're already a superstar of cycling. It's been phenomenal to watch your progress so quickly from the outside. You mentioned earlier about skating, and there's a lot of Dutch riders that have come from that background as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a Dutch, you always do two things. Uh, you start uh, uh, yeah, to train, uh, and that's, yeah, ice skating is very important for us, and cycling as well. Um, and I think ice skating, you use also a bit similar muscles, so it's uh, pretty easy to combine. Uh, as an ice skater, you sit also a lot on the bike, uh, the other way around, not so much, but um, yeah, I think as an ice skater, we have so many good ice skaters in Holland, so uh, if you cannot make it to the top top, because that's super difficult in Holland, then um, yeah, then automatically uh, you start searching for another uh, goal, of course, and yeah, for me, it, 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 cycling was always something what I really liked uh, to do, and um, it felt very natural to step over into cycling. Now, many, many, many years ago, I used to race a bike, but it was very hard as a youth, as a kid, junior rider, as a, as a female to find any racing in the UK back in, in those times. Did you have a lot of opportunities to race as a little girl? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it started already with those uh, fat bike races, uh, the fat, fat tire races. And, um, yeah, after, after that, uh, when I was 16 and I started with the real races, um, you have a lot of, uh, of races. Uh, you have the, the, the club competition, uh, and that was really nice. Uh, yeah, almost every weekend, I think every weekend you could race somewhere, um, or it was a criterium, or it was a little classic uh, race for, the, for us. So yeah, that, that, that makes it also that uh, the Dutchies are so uh, successful, I think. Um, yeah, that was, that was really nice that you could always race somewhere. 
And also, something we've discussed before is the structure around cycling as a form of getting around um, in Holland. It, it's huge. It's always been so part of life, growing up riding a bike day to day. Does that influence why there's so much success in professional ranks? Does that cross over? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, as a kid you, you learn to ride your bike because it's one of the biggest um, things in Holland. You, you go to, to school on the bike, you go to your work on the bike, so um, that makes it also that it's so a big sport, I think. And when did it become super competitive? When did you decide, like, this is my career, I'm, I'm going to go absolutely everything into racing bikes? Um, I think this was uh, the year 2018, um, when I just met my boyfriend uh, before that, and he said already, yeah, you're very talented, uh, you should go focus only on cycling, um, and stop with ice skating. At first I said, fuck you, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to quit ice skating, I, I really like it, I love it, um, but then, um, yeah, my ice skating season was not good, and Eventually, I, I ended up um, riding my bike more and more, and going on the training camp, and also with him going to the Ardennes. Uh, yeah, that was really nice. Um, and then, yeah, I, I started to train more, and also I, I came. Um, I, tra I started training with a trainer, and uh, then it went very fast. Uh, I mean, the next year I was with Parkinson already. So, yeah, I think the year before Parkinson was only the year I started seriously. I was going to say that it feels very fast from my standpoint that you've progressed and it's interesting that that it is the reality, it has been fast. Yeah, I mean, before that I also was riding my bike pretty often and uh, also in, uh, in combination with ice skating, but just uh, as, as something I really like to do. Uh, after school I went on the bike, just do an hour, or I went to the, uh, the, the little club uh, in the close by and I did some uh, evening races and evening grid. Um, so it was really playful, I think, always, and I didn't really train, uh, I didn't do efforts or something, so yeah, I, I just did the races and some easy rides, uh, and it was really nice. In the winter I was on the, on the ice ring, um, so yeah, when I started to train uh, for real with a trainer, uh, it went very fast because uh, I could improve so much. Uh, first I started to do efforts and that kind of things, and some longer rides, and yeah, after that um, I was still, I, I came already by Parkato and I never did uh, for example, I never went to the gym or something. I, of course, I did the land trainings uh, for ice skating, but then I started to also do some wide training. And yeah, I mean, there was so much improvement also left for me because I did years before always so playful and um, not so structured yet. So there was so much space to improve and that, uh, that helped also a lot, I think. And when you went into Park Hotel and the team set up there, was it a big change for you? Was there a big shift in training and structure? Yeah, I mean, um, every year uh, that, 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 yeah, when I started with my trainer, every year after that, you start to train a bit more and more and more, um, and also different kind of trainings. Um, so yeah, that, the, that trainings you always, I, I, I build it all up and, um, I think that for the trainings it did not really change for my feelings so much because I kept the same trainer and yeah we just made sure that I improved uh, but not too fast so that that space for improving also stayed there. Um, but of course I, I came in an environment that was much more professional and uh, I made a little money from it so that was also nice. I stopped with working the year before so um, yeah, I mean, then you're also a bit more free uh, to do really what you like and to go really all in uh, for cycling. I think often, again, as, as fans of the sport, watching from the outside, I can say, right, that was your biggest win or that was a real breakthrough moment. But in your mind, what was the first time that you went home with a result and you just thought, like, I'm so happy with that achievement in the peloton? Um... I think it was Liège uh, 2019 because 
that was my first uh, pro year, but also immediately in third place. So that was very special for me. And I know that you always, always reflect, and especially as we say in the off season, you, you look back at what you've achieved, what you want to achieve the next time. And I'm going to see if my memory is serving me correctly now. Revanche Peel 2021. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that because we'll go on to talk about all the many, many successes. But that was a photo finish. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody knows what I'm referring to here. I don't unfortunately think we have that photo finish. But you thought you'd got it on the line and then found out actually not quite. Yeah. I think this was the year from the photo finishes because in Amsterdam Gold Race it was the same as it and uh, in uh, Van Aert. But, um, yeah, that was very strange. I, I really thought I had it. And also with Winder, uh, she, she ended up with the win, of course, but she said to me, I really thought you won. And I said, yeah, I also had that feeling, but in the end, it was not so. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you were going to come to that agreement. Like, no, I yeah. can definitely, yeah, that's fine. You got that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very that. Yeah. And also, I, I didn't realize at all, so I, I celebrated already with my teammates. And then I came back by the podium. He was a bit laughing at me, so I was like, what's happening? And then he said, yeah, don't celebrate too early. And I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why? I won. I won. <laughs> no, you're second. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I was not. <laughs> and at first he was joking or something, but he was not, so it was a bit pity. <laughs> Does it make you think twice about getting your hand yeah, yeah, now? Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> yeah, now I do it only after the finish line, not on the finish line anymore. Just, just waiting to make sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that really stood out for me around that time is the volume of people commenting, social media, Twitter, people having an opinion. Did you get it? Did you not? Do you absorb all these things? Do you read social media? Do you listen to it? Yeah, well, first, then, oh, yeah, there it is. There we go. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's not a huge amount in that, is there? No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, first, I, I only got this picture um, when I was at the jury, and then I was like, yeah, I lost. But then on the internet afterwards, I saw so many pictures from all kinds of sides, and on all those other pictures, it looks like I won. So it was very different for me. So it was also a bit of a roller coaster because I thought I won, and then they said not, so I thought, okay, I didn't win. And then I opened social media, and I saw all those pictures from all kinds of sides, and I thought, but I, th I did win, <laughs> so it was very strange to, to feel this kind of roller coaster. But in the end, it also it doesn't matter because I mean, if you're so close to the win, it's also nice, right? <laughs> exactly, and I'm glad to hear you saying that because it was a fantastic race, regardless. And, and actually, I do think I tweeted a picture before I saw this, where it, from that perspective, really just looked like yeah. over the night. So yeah, a fantastic result, nonetheless. And you came back the following season and. and that one, didn't you? Yeah, we were joking already, and then uh, there we go. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. Huh? <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on. We're going to stop. We're stop. <laughs> not going to say that you definitely won that. Um, but yeah, you, you came back and, and you got the result. Yeah, it was it was funny because uh, in the meeting before uh, we were already joking. Now today, then I do solo. Then then it's yeah. I mean, then it's obvious, right? And also after this finish, a lot of people said, yeah, just go solo, it's easier. Then they see that you won. And then uh, I was like, yeah, I know, I will try next year. And I tried the next year and yeah, it worked out. It certainly did. I mean, I just don't know where to start <laughs> with how well the last two seasons have gone. I mean, has it really just felt like a really big breakthrough season? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think last year was my, my, my big, uh, yeah. Step up, I think, because I won Lier, of course, and uh, this year was a bit different, of course, because Anna was not in the team as a rider anymore, um, so I needed to get a bit used to that because um, the year before I uh, I was riding with Anna, and that was really nice because everybody was always watching Anna, and then I could sneak out or do my thing a bit uh, in her shadow, and 
and now this year I was different because she was not there anymore and they started to look at me and that was a whole different kind of writing for me, it was new, um, but I think I, I handled it well and uh, yeah, it was also good to experience again. So for anyone that doesn't know, Anna, Anna Brogan retired and went into the team car yeah. as, as director of sport team. How has it been having her in your ear? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really nice. I mean, this race was already, she was behind me in the car and she knows how to do this kind of solo. So uh, yeah, you just do what she says. And I mean, she was always a step before because she really knows what goes through your mind and how you feel. So you're riding solo and before it goes in your mind already from, oh, this is heavy, she says, okay, then you know it's gonna be hard, but you need to keep pu pushing, and she really knows what kind of things you feel in, in, in a race, so that's really helpful always. Tour de France fan of Zwift. We have a Tour de France. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? a fantastic inaugural edition it was for you. Um, polka dot jersey, podium. Can, can you just talk us through your reflections on, on the race as a whole? Yeah, I mean, Tour de France was really nice to have. And, uh, I was really happy with this race. And also when I saw the, the, uh, the stages uh, when they announced it, uh, I was super happy because uh, I live in Switzerland and uh, close to the border to, to French. And in the year of COVID, I did a really nice uh, training. Um, uh, I wanted to do something else in another area, and then my boyfriend said, "Okay, come, we go to the to the French, and then uh, you start at the Grand Ballon, and maybe you can also do Planche Belleville." So I made a really nice route to come out, and uh, I started uh, on the bottom of the Grand Ballon, and I rode it, and then I went to Planche Belleville, and I finished on top there, and um, he waited for me in the car there. And uh, yeah, well, I was riding up uh, Plunge Bellefi. I, I started to fantasy I already a little bit about uh, how it would be for the men to race there. And then, uh, yeah, I thought, how would it be if we women race on this kind of mountain? And uh, yeah, then when they announced the, the, the course, uh, we also uh, came over that uh, two climbs. So that was really special for me. I mean, I did already the record and I, I knew already how it felt to, to go there. Um, uh, yeah, when this race finally started off, I, I was just really happy that, uh, that we had this kind of race back again. Super Planche de Belfi, you've mentioned a couple of times. I mean, the, the gradient of that, the surface, it look, looks a bit grippy, to, to say the least. Um, let's talk about your rivalry with Anna and Mieke van Vluten. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's always a very, very hard with her because yeah, you know, she is uh, capable of doing uh, super, super hard uh, things in a race. Um, and you know, uh, on this, this that kind of, kind of climb, she's really good. So yeah, you know she's going to attack somewhere, but of course you don't know where. Um, and I mean, stage seven was, uh, she started immediately off. And uh, yeah, you know that it's kind of going to happen. And, uh, normally in races, uh, you feel that the whole, whole bunch is kind of uh, nervous for her attack. I mean, you know that's gonna happen, and, and you really want to beat her also, so you need to hang on with her. Um, yeah, and then uh, the moment uh, when she went into her, uh, I, I did a lot of mental work also, so um, yeah, I, I prepared myself for that moment. Uh, normally, you feel always a little panic uh, if you need to uh, leave a little gap, but now we're on stage seven, uh, I, I could hang on, and at one point uh, I needed to drop from her. Um, I thought, okay, it's okay, I just focus on my own race now, um, don't panic, and uh, yeah, I mean, then it was also a very long solo for me, and um, yeah, it was different, but uh, yeah, I mean, she's from another world. <laughs> <laughs> she is. But we had Kasia Nuvadova on stage with us both yesterday, didn't we? And she said something really interesting, that you are a game changer in that you didn't just accept Van Vluten's going to go and I'm going to accept that she's just going to go. I mean, you talked about clinging on, staying on that wheel, riding your own race, and it was a game changer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I think she's beatable. I, and 
because everybody's beatable, only we didn't find out how yet, and uh, I'm really busy with finding out how we need to beat her, but um, yeah, I, I expect also from the other girls that they want to beat her, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, you want to be the best, and if you need, need to, if you want to be the best, then you need to beat her, of course, so uh, yeah, I wanted to, to do that in the tour, of course, already, yeah. but it didn't work, but no problem, I will try again. There's, an there's another year. <laughs> and I say another year because people started saying, well, Andy Pamplin is going to retire. But you, you want to beat her before that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that, uh, yeah, if you cannot do it before, then, uh, then it's always a question also for yourself. Uh, because uh, it's also something she said to me, it comes by years. I mean, she's already a lot longer in, into cycling and every year you train a bit more and a bit harder and you get every year a little bit stronger and better. Um, so yeah, if she stops next year, then uh, maybe I'm not on my top yet. So that's a bit of pity. And then you also cannot compare it anymore um, with her, of course. So I mean, she's important for cycling because she also lifts the whole women's bunch to another level. We need to train as hard as she does because yeah, we want to beat her. So we also need to do that work. I'm aware that um, I've only got time for probably one more question and I really want to get this one in before we actually put some questions out to the audience. Um, the Dutch squad, you have so in fact every single person at points going to Worlds, going to Olympics, are winners within your team, <laughs> within your national squad. How on earth do you manage that dynamic when any one of you could go for that victory? Yeah, that's difficult, of course. I mean, uh, normally you're, uh, you're comp competitors from each other, and uh, yeah, then suddenly on another race you need to be teammates. Um, that's always a bit difficult, of course, but uh, I think we are all professionals, so um, yeah, you just do it. Uh, also, a bit for your country, of course. I mean, we come all from the same country, and as soon as we put the orange kit on, you're, you're teammates. So, um, in the race, you always also feel as teammates, um, and you don't think so much anymore. Um, but of course, this is different uh, for Holland, I think, uh, especially, uh, yeah, uh, in the meetings already, it's, uh, yeah, who is getting a chance? Um, that's that's a bit uh, always uh, a big question, uh, and uh, we always try to talk multiple times about it. And uh, yeah, it's it's also the day. I mean, you can say um, now, Demi, now it's your turn to go on the World Championships, but then you have COVID, <laughs> for example. Um, yeah, it, that can happen so much in racing. So yeah, I mean. It's, it's all kind of situations uh, yeah, coming together and um, I mean, we're also professionals, so yeah, you just deal with it and uh, yeah, you just go uh, with each other uh, in the same race and uh, try to make the best of it. Oh, it has just been fascinating. As you can tell, I want to keep this chat going all day, but we're going to have to close in. And I'm really aware that we, as I mentioned, have some children in the audience. And I'd like to see if anyone's got any questions for Demi. And we'll bring a microphone around to you. Two, time for two questions. I know it's a bit scary putting your hand up, but I'm sure we've got one over here, I think. Um, the impression I got when you were at Park was you were a bit more of a sprinter. I think that's because of the races you were doing when you were with them. And obviously now you're winning mountain jersey at the tour. How was it, and, you know, physically, it looks like your whole body shape changed. I just wondered how that was. Was that your decision? Was that a coach's decision? Or where that came about? Um, I think um, I'm not a pure sprinter. I mean, I'm not, uh, not the kind of uh, rider like Lorena, but um, I, I have that punch in me, um, but that punch get better after a really hard race. So I really needed um, uh, a hard race uh, to, to show my punch a bit. I think um, it's a bit. Um, I think in the race I also feel it. In the beginning, beginning of the race, I sometimes have it really hard, and then in the end of the race, I think where's the rest now? And I feel really good, but. I think my level stays a bit on the same. I always say I'm a, I'm a diesel, so yeah, I'm over the whole race pretty consistent, and 
yeah, the most of the riders are in the beginning of the race super good, and then the fatigue come in and they get a little bit less good. And I think I'm pretty stable or something. So in the end of the race, I can have that punch. But for, of course, I did um, last year a lot of um, focus on, on the longer efforts for longer climbs. Um, and uh, also I did a lot of VO2 max trainings because this is also good for the shorter efforts, but also for the for the longer efforts. Um, yeah, I think I, I need hard races and um, big mountains are uh, yeah already big uh, hard races, of course. So yeah, I think that that helps a lot. That uh, yeah, after a hard race, I have still kind of punch. And we're going to take our final question just from the front. What was your best moment in the tour? My best memory? Um, that's a good question. I think when I got the Boca del Jersey and I saw my whole family behind uh, shouting for me. <laughs> See, you're emotional. Yeah. You're making me emotional. <laughs> oh, what a lovely note to end on before I start weeping up here. Please put your hands together for this. Thank you.